Welcome to the sixth episode of our series called The New World Order or The New World Disorder. Uh, depends a little bit uh, on your take. What we're doing in this series is basically going through uh, the different chapters of a book uh, that I'm working on. Uh, if you've had the opportunity to watch the first five episodes, you will know that the book contains obviously uh, an, uh, preface, a preface, an intro, uh, and then three parts with three chapters in each part. The working title of the book is The Global West versus The Global East, or How the Global South Will Decide the New World Disorder. Uh, and today we'll start uh, a new part of the book, and that part uh, is called the balance of power. So in three chapters we will be looking at specifically the global west first, then the global east, and finally the global south. Because it's this sort of oscillation of power, uh, balance of power uh, between these three power centers that will determine the direction in which we go. My argument is that it's not self-evident, it's not clear, uh, what is going to happen, but in the next decade we'll be shaping some kind of a new world order, which probably will be quite a lot messier uh, than what we are used to and not as clear and see a lot of different alliances. But it's always good to try to, you know, look at uh, what the similarities and, and differences are. And that's what I intend to do today when I deal with chapter four uh, on the global west. I will have uh, a little introduction then I will talk about uh, three key trends. One is politics, two is economics, and three is technology. And then I finish off by looking at the differences inside the global west, and then the differences from the global east and the global south before I then conclude. And as custom has it, I will begin by uh, reading out the prologue. Uh, of this chapter, which goes like this. June 2016, Barasund, midsummer in the Finnish archipelago. I watch the bonfire go out and go to bed confident that Brexit won't happen. I glance at my phone around 3 a.m. I can't believe my eyes. Brexit. This was not supposed to be possible. It doesn't make sense. The UK is the cradle of common sense and reason. Leaving the EU is a bit like leaving the internet. You can always pull the plug, but it's better to try to influence the content online. Fast forward five months. I smirk at the thought of Donald Trump being elected the president of the oldest democracy in the world. No way. We're on holiday in the US and I watch the Republican Party nominate Trump. I tell my kids, you can't lie your way into office. I'm wrong again. My arrogant smirk turns, turns into a sulk of disbelief. It feels like democracy is in tatters. I soon begin to realize that as a student and practitioner of democracy, I seem to have a limited understanding of it. Just because democracy doesn't produce the result I want to, it doesn't make it wrong. Probably the opposite. And when I look around at other democracies in the global West, there's a pattern in decision-making. Chaos, sorry, crisis, chaos, and suboptimal solution. Democracy has a way of muddling through, or does it? So that's the prologue, because I'm looking at the global West, and of course the starting point is that the global West, by way of introduction, has been a very dominant force in world politics uh, for a couple of centuries. It wasn't always like this, but uh, for the intent and purposes of our argument in this book, it certainly has been. It is the architect of the world order, both in the post-1945 and post-1989 era. Uh, it is also a group of countries which have prosperity, welfare and uh, a regulatory uh, advantage. Now, who do I mean when I talk about the global West? Well, for me, it is North America, or more particularly uh, the United States and Canada. It is 
Europe or, and, of course, the European Union. It's Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand. So we're talking about, you know, roughly 40 countries here. Uh, the development level of these countries is very high. They have high income. Um, some of them are in G7, some in the EU, some in NATO, most in the OECD, some in uh, the OSCE, uh, some in uh, the Council of, of Europe. And of course, in this group, if you really want to look at traditional balance of power, there are of course key players, the United States being the self-evident one, uh, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, say Japan, uh, and Australia. All of them are very important players, of course, in the global West. But let's dissect then first politics, then economics, and then uh, technology. So the global West, politically, it's democratic, different forms of democracy, sure. It believes in the rule of law, uh, freedom of expression, human rights, the protection of minorities, very much open societies. Most of the countries in the global West are parliamentary democracies, but they're also presidential democracies, in other words, republics, and of course, then, you know, monarchies as well uh, in the system. They all have fairly strong civil society, strong institutions, and a traditional separation of powers between uh, the executive, judicial, and uh, the legislative. Now, uh, of course, democracy has many different forms. We've talked about it in this series before. Um, democracy used to be created in a world that doesn't exist anymore. It was supposed to be slow, cumbersome, and compromise-seeking, but we live in a technological world where things happen uh, very fast, so it has to be uh, reactive. Uh, in the past decades, we've seen the emergence of populism uh, in democratic societies, both from the left and the right. We've seen a lot of polarization. I think the United States is a prime example thereof. Uh, the political climate in the United States between the Republicans and the Democrats and in the respective parties is actually uh, quite uh, toxic. Uh, a lot of times in democracy before you had a choice between, okay, do I choose stability? In other words, vote for the guys who are still in power or do I vote for change? In other words, the ones who are in opposition. Now there seems to be a mega trend that politicians don't stay in power for that long or parties for that matter. So you kind of want more change than uh, stability. Uh, there is of course another problem with democracies today and that is that you cannot have political discourse uh, if you don't agree on the basic facts and of course there's ample uh, disinformation, uh, fake news, uh, unfactual information out there. Media literacy seems to be uh, very complicated. Uh, and the big question, of course, for democracies, and we have to pose the questions, is, you know, number one, can it govern in a world of rapid change? Question mark. Um, will it be able to deliver on the megatrends that we're all dealing with? So climate and democracy and technology? Question mark. Um, will democracies remain cohesive and united? Question mark. So, you know, a lot of discrepancies uh, in, in politics, in, in the system, but it seems most of the time to muddle through. Winston Churchill used to say that, you know, democracy is the worst form of government except all the others. And I think he was probably quite right. Uh, secondly, economics. So, you know, global West, why, why, what's the sort of economic profile? Well, to simplify, it's capitalistic. It's about uh, free markets and, and, and free trade. Does this mean that it's rampant capitalism and full free uh, markets and free trade? Of course not. Uh, I mean, there are always regulations uh, in, in capitalist systems. Uh, also, welfare states of, of uh, various forms. The big difference is between Nordic welfare states, from where I come myself, or the United States, and actually inside the United States uh, uh, as well. Uh, historically, you could argue that the global West has had very strong uh, economies. You know, someone says that you go back uh, a century or so and you're talking about global GDP being 75% uh, in the global West and now only 16%. So things uh, change. 
Uh, there's also been a strong, I think, pendulum swinging between what I call market and state. So in the early 1990s, it was all about market and market liberalization. And now we're starting to see a lot of, of course, uh, state uh, intervention. So moves towards protectionism and, and state aid and, and sort of protecting your, your natural resources and, and, and strategic uh, assets. Uh, value change. There's a lot of talk about sovereignty and uh, autonomy. And of course, another element that, that plays into the game is, is the way in which companies uh, have to act and react and behave uh, in a global context today, otherwise known as, of course, the ESGs. So the questions that we have to pose about the global West and its economies are very simple. Will it deliver growth and welfare in the future? Question mark. Uh, will it cope with um, the demographic challenge? Question mark. In other words, a lot of us in the global West have aging populations. How can we cope with that service balance? Uh, and thirdly, will it continue to set the standards? There's been a lot of talk about the EU being the regulatory superpower. Wonderful book written by Anu Bradford on this called The Brussels Effect. Now, will the rest of the world adapt to European or uh, the standards of the global West in the future, I think it's a fair enough uh, question mark to have. The third uh, megatrend that I look at when we look at balance of power is, is, is technology. And I, I, I do this because I do firmly believe that it has a significant impact on the balance of power between the global West, the global East and uh, the global South. And of course, it has an impact on all the policies uh, and actually the value debate that we have in the world uh, as well. And of course, by technology, I mean, and I look at it from a broad perspective. So artificial intelligence, robotization, biotechnology, you know, Internet of Things, quantum computing. So everything that's related to technology and how that impacts our lives. And of course, my argument is the classic one. And remember that the original outline of this book was about tech. Uh, my argument is very simple. Uh, the technological revolution, whatever we want to call it, uh, will change the economy and the way in which we work, politics and the way in which we communicate, and science and the way in which we are, uh, the way in which we are as, as, as human beings. Uh, and of course, uh, in this chapter, I go into an in-depth conversation about what kind of jobs we're looking at the future, in the future, uh, you know, what kind of platforms exist in the global West, you know, why was Europe very strong on telecommunications in the 1990s, but then probably weaker on digitalization and platforms that the United States is very strong on at the time. I also look, you know, at, at the Asian impact on electronics in the 1980s, you know, uh, Japan, uh, and of course nowadays uh, South Korea. I look at some of the companies uh, that are there, but I also go into a conversation about, you know, what does um, technology do to, to democracy, the way in which we communicate. Uh, and, of course, I also look at probably the most fundamental things, uh, that is science, not only CRISPR technology, uh, but, but also, uh, of course, uh, things like artificial intelligence or, or social media. What does it do to, to our brain? So I pose these questions, uh, ethical questions about technology, uh, also about, you know, technological warfare. Uh, you know, how do we make sure that artificial intelligence is human-driven, not uh, machine-driven. Uh, uh, this is linked very much to the ethical choices that we have to make when we uh, try to make uh, common rules for uh, the management uh, and administration of uh, global uh, technology. Fourthly, I go into a conversation in this chapter about the differences inside the global West, because of course I'm you know, simplifying. No matter where you're following this series from around the world, you know that you know, there are a whole bunch of democracies around and have very different, uh, you know, uh, very different characteristics. I have a conversation about hard power, soft power and smart power, you know, the classic things that Joe Nye has talked about. And of course there, the United States is a superpower pretty much on, on really all fronts. Whereas the EU, you know, is, 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 a, is a superpower on the soft side and the, and the smart side, but, 
you know, is it a military superpower? Well, no, you know, not, not necessarily. Um, and of course, you know, some inside the EU have a colonial past and that has an impact on, on, on what kind of, you know, relationships it, it can have with the rest of the world as, as well. I personally, I guess, come from a rather uh, inoffensive country in the form of Finland, which, uh, you know, hasn't been that much of an imperialist in, in, in the olden days and still is not. Don't worry about that. So many different ways and aspects that you can, you can look at. Also look at the different types of alliances that, that have and, and how geography impacts the global West because, you know, it's not a geographic concept as such because, of course, you know, we have parts of the global West in the Indo-Pacific uh, and, and, of course, in, in, you know, in Asia. So it, it, I try to problematize it a little bit. Uh, I also, in this part, have a conversation on the U.S. strategy. Uh, which we've talked about in a different series in, 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 in this lecture series. Uh, I, I, I look at the EU strategic compass, you know, what, what is the approach? How does the US approach China? How does Europe approach China? Or how do the countries in the Indo-Pacific, you know, approach China or Russia for that matter? So a lot of different aspects to look at here. Um, I also look at other differences, you know, the, the notion of capitalism, the welfare and the use of data very different in the US from, from uh, Europe um, uh, or the Indo-Pacific as, as such. Um, then finally and fifthly, before I conclude on this chapter, I look at the differences of the global West to the global East and the global South. Uh, and of course, you know, here I tried to hammer down the argument that, you know, the, the, the sort of big game here is between the global West and the global East, so Russia and China, uh, and that tension and, and competition is, is very much uh, systemic, it's strategic, and it's about the world order. Uh, it's really about values and interests and about power. Big difference is there. Whereas, uh, you know, I, I, and also about the individual and the collective. Whereas I argue that, you know, the global south is different in here. It doesn't want to inherently make a choice between the global east and the global west. Uh, it's much more of a hybrid. It's looking much more for representation and agency. It's more focused on policies like climate change or food security and energy rather than, you know, what is the ideological battle between the global west and, and the global east. In many ways, I, I think global south is, is kind of more pragmatic and sensible on this, if, if I may simplify a little bit. Um, and, and also on the differences on history and cooperation and the, you know, complexities that some of the former colonial powers have in, in dealing with, uh, with the uh, global south and having uh, cooperation. Uh, and then I conclude. Uh, on the global west, I, I say the following three things. I think the global west, need, number one, needs to understand uh, that uh, the war in Ukraine has changed the world and we have come to the end of the post-Cold War era. And this has ramifications uh, in general. Second, I think it needs to focus a lot on the home turf. Uh, in other words, if you really want to have an impact on the world order, on you know, making the world more democratic, you need to have your home, home turf in order, politically, economically, and, and, and technologically. And thirdly, uh, I give a humble piece of advice, I guess normative in a sense, that I think the global West needs to start looking at even talking about a joint, um, you know, global strategy instead of having these separate ones on, you know, European strategy and American strategy. Perhaps it's time to, you know, sit down, G40, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, coming together. So I think finally that the global West has to avoid being tone deaf avoid taking the moral high ground and deal with our past mistakes because that's the only way in which uh, we can basically become engaged uh, with uh, the rest of the world. But a basic understanding that the world is changing, I think is already a good starting point. So my chapter on the global West contains an introduction. And after that, one se uh, uh, section on politics, one on economics, one on technology, one on the differences inside the global West, and one of the differences that we in the global West have with uh, the global East and the global South. 
This is all of course setting the scene for later chapters, but before we go there, the next lecture is going to be on the Global East. Please stay tuned and remember to follow uh, our YouTube channel of the STG. Thank you very much for listening and watching. Thank <laughs> you.